against it. Could you please give us a sense first about um, what was distinctive about the fatwa that you issued and the degree to which you think that could be usefully repeated uh, as to a degree it has been in other countries, whether it's the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, whether it's uh, uh, the United Arab Emirates, whether it's Indonesia, and whether the, the nature of these fatwas have to be you know, particularly afraid to deal with a particular form of Islam or Islamic um, um, uh, structure that exists in different countries, or whether there's a one size fits all policy for fatwas of this kind. <laughs> After thanks, Mr. Chairman, I would like to first of all say a few words categorically that terrorism has no religion. No religion on the earth preaches extremism, radicalism, and terrorism. This is just a criminal attitude which can develop out of any kind of environment, and there are many causes behind it. The fatwa which you have discussed now mentioned, and I am supposed to explain some distinctive features of that fatwa. <coughs> I have just taken one aspect of the terrorism in this fatwa. I have not discussed the root causes. I have not discussed the political causes, the regional, local, or global causes. I have not taken into consideration the socio-economic causes and many other political aspects which need to be analyzed and discussed, I have not taken into consideration. My 600-page fatwa, I have just concentrated on a single point, and that is that what is Islamic stance and Islamic jurisprudential, theological, and academic or religious viewpoint on act of killing, whether Muslims or non-Muslims, or act of suicide bombing, or any kind of act of terrorism in any form and any manifestation. So I have taken it into the consideration of the classical view. This is the first fatwa, the distinctive point in the whole Islamic uh, present era, Muslim. Many other scholars, uh, like Sheikh Ulazhar, ex Sheikh Ulazhar, Yusuf al Tantavi, Grand Mufti of Egypt, and many other scholars issued brief fatwas, not a very big, elaborated, detailed, documented one. This is the first detailed documented fatwa consisting of thousands of evidences. But the basic distinct point is they give, while giving the fatwa, created some conditionalities, ifs and buts. To me, if you condemn the act of terrorism, and after condemn, statement of condemnation, you create any kind of if and but, or put any kind of conditionality, it means you are creating the ways of legalizing some aspects of terrorism. So I have totally abolished ifs and buts, no conditionality. This is the first fatwa which has declared that terrorism and act of suicide bombing, considering that killing is permissible. This is an act of disbelief. Whoever commits it, wherever commits it, without any condition, without any situation or exception. And how wide did you think it's been read? Yes. It was read very, not only in the Western world. I would appreciate Western world, first time in our present two decades, appreciated the stance of Islam very, very nicely, and you are very well aware of that, right from states to Indonesia and to European countries all over the world, up to Jerusalem. But the Arab world also appreciated it. So the Arabian-based paper, Ashar also gave three full pages, including the front page, with my pictures, and now they are planning to publish it verbatim, word by word. Egypt, Saudi Arabia, about 1.5 million Arabic websites were discussing my fatwa on their own websites and blogs and their discussions. So it was very well read everywhere. But the basic question is, so the second thing is that I have decided that unless we de-link the act of terrorism with, from Islam and from any religion, we won't be able to succeed in the war of terror. At the moment we say Islamic terrorism, Islamic terrorists, the moment we say them Islamists, or Islamic terrorists, or Islamic radicals, or jihadists, <coughs> this kind of terminology provides them a way of legitimacy. They legitimate 
their viewpoint in front of the youth, those who are already frustrated because of their socio-economic condition, their regional, local and political atmosphere which they are because of the lack of justice in their own countries, their problems are not being addressed properly. So when they say that they are Islamist and this is Islamic terrorism, so Bin Laden, Zawahiri and these kind of people, they gain ground out of that as if they are really fighting for Islam. They are defending the cause of Islam and they are defending the cause of Muslim Ummah. And that's why they get a very big theological support. So first of all, we have to totally de-link the Islamic terms from every kind of radicalism, extremism and terrorism. And we have to convey the message to the mankind and to the Muslim. Terrorism is just an act of criminality. And you have to deal with them, as our honorable guest said, that as, as, as criminal stupidity, they have no link with Islam. They are out of ambit of Islam. And the Holy Quran and the Sunnah of Prophet, peace be upon him, have declared them out of the ambit of Islam. These terrorists, these people are in fact the legacy of Kharijite movement. The Kharijite movement was the first movement, terrorist movement of the radicals who took up the arms against the third and fourth orthodox caliph, guided caliph of Islam, Sayyidina Usman and Sayyidina Ali. And both were killed by their hands. And they started a big armed struggle against the government and against the state. And they challenged the writ of the government. And they raised the slogan of the implementation of the Islamic system, La Hukma Illa Gilla. So they bring the Islamic slogans just to attract the emotions and sentiments of the youth and to exploit their frustrations, which are really economic, social, and political, and they legitimize their criminal acts because of this terminology. And in fact, this fatwa condemns it in its absoluteness, and it has declared that there is no exception in any case for anybody who can kill any Muslim or non-Muslim. Even a non-Muslim belongs to a state which state is at war with a Muslim country. You can just fight with combatants in a battlefield. You have no uh, permission in any case to fight against non-combatants and civilians. Thanks very much. And we'll want to also um, return to, 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 to these issues of, uh, of, of social cohesion that you've also very much addressed. So, but let me make certain I get round to, to everyone else too. Um, Imran Khan, um, you are, if I can put it this way, uh, a small L liberal politician in, uh, in, in Pakistan. Uh, we saw a, a violent assassination carried out by a bodyguard of an important governor in Pakistan uh, recently who apparently didn't share entirely uh, the views of how to interpret the laws of blasphemy of some of the extremists. And I guess the question I have to you is whether you think that the liberal space in Pakistan is shrinking in some way and the space for extremism somehow uh, is uh, expanding and what is a liberal uh, you can do to reoccupy that larger space in Pakistan. Well, <clears throat> well thanks. I think um, if you look at Pakistan uh, from 2004 onwards, when Pakistan army went into the Pakistan's tribal areas, that is the beginning of radicalization in the country. Before that, Pakistan had no Taliban, Pakistan had no suicide bombings, Pakistan had uh, 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 militant groups, but controlled by the establishment. Pakistan did not have uh, the sort of uh, uh, anything like the suicide attacks, the sort of uh, radicalization, which Pakistan has now. So the assassination of Salman Taseer basically has suddenly opened people's eye up to the incredible polarization that has taken place in Pakistan. So what is uh, what people don't know, they know about, they've heard about Salman Tarsil's murder, but they don't know that before Salman Tarsil's murder, <coughs> from 2004 onwards, pro, so either you were pro-American, anti-Islam, or you were uh, pro-Islam and anti-American. So the divide became greater, polarization became uh, increasingly more radicalized. So we saw, first of all, the army being targeted as pro-American, security forces being targeted. We had the Awami National Party, which was considered a secular party close to the Americans, hence uh, hundreds of workers of the ANP were murdered. Then we started having uh, religious scholars being targeted who <coughs> spoke against suicide bombing. 
So now if Mr. Tahirul Qadri, what he has said today here, if he was to now say this in Pakistan, his life would be in danger. So that is the sort of radicalization which is going on. People are petrified today, and, and with, with the assassination of Salman Taseer, uh, it came as a shock to everyone that even his own party would not back him. There were not, uh, there were, there were not any um, uh, um, Molanas or Malvis who would even say his, uh, his prayer, prayer, lost prayer, um, lost prayer. funeral prayers. Funeral they couldn't prayers. find anyone there. So such was the fear that even the president and the prime minister didn't openly condemn him. Uh, the situation in Pakistan has got so radicalized today that I can give you in writing that the, the murderer of Salman Taseer will not be convicted by any judge in Pakistan because he will be too scared for his life, his family's life. And so the, my, uh, you know, my uh, take on all this is that I oppose from day one the military operations. I always thought that the military operations were going to radicalize our society, and I, and so I was co on the other side. I consider myself a liberal, but I was considered pro-Taliban because I oppose the military operations. But what have the military operations done? They have all they have done is that they have created a new wave of militants in Pakistan, where there was not one Taliban group. According to the army, there are 30 different Taliban groups operating in the country, and. Uh, I just want to quote Rand Corporation. They, they came up with a report of terrorism, of all terrorism in the last 40 years. According to that, only 7% of terrorist movements were solved by military actions, military operations. Uh, according to that, 93%, half were solved by political dialogue and the other half by policing and intelligence. So I think that the more military operations our army has done, the more drone attacks have taken place in Pakistan, the more our society is getting radicalized. But can I just uh, challenge you a little bit on that? Because a lot of people in Pakistan have criticized the drone attacks um, for uh, the surge of radicalization. But if you, the, the current debate on the blasphemy law can't really be linked to the specifics of the amount of predator attacks that are taking place. There had to have been a little bit more there uh, into which uh, uh, these extremists uh, could usefully uh, move. Isn't it a bit much to blame the drone attacks on uh, uh, for the execution of, 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 of Governor Tahrir? Uh, it's not just the drone attacks. It's the whole war on terror. It's the whole Pakistan military operations. It's the bombardment of villages by, um, by drones and by artillery, Pakistan army, by F-16s. Collateral damage, killing of civilians, children. It is radicalizing our society. So that's why we've reached to this point. What Salman Taseer said, had he said this, this before 2004, it would not even have got a mention in the newspapers. Forget about him getting killed. Today, the situation is so <coughs> bad. If, if you ask Mr. Tyrell Qadri to go and say these things openly, he, he knows his life would be in danger. He will not be able to give this fatwa in Pakistan and, and be safe, because he will be considered on the other side of the divide, a collaborator. So, so, so it is that divide that has taken place. It's the polarization in our society which is so dangerous. Thanks. We'll, we'll, we'll want to come back to the, the, these diverse causes. But let me perhaps now turn to uh, Audrey Cronin uh, just to uh, widen our perspective um, slightly, and then we can go back to these specific cases on which we have such authority on this panel. But Audrey, why don't you give us a couple of minutes on how, in your view, uh, the terrorist threat generally uh, has changed over the last several years? Oh, sure. Thank you, John. Um, let me just uh, pick up on one point with respect to that RAND um, report, which was um, actually quite an interesting report, but, uh, but quite incomplete. Um, the research that I did for my book on how terrorism ends actually looks at other ways of ending for uh, groups, uh, including negotiations, and some groups have ended through the killing of the leader uh, or the capturing of the leader far more often, um, reorientation of the violence. There are lots of other ways that these groups have ended. It's not simply a matter of law enforcement intelligence versus um, military repression. But I completely agree with you that military repression is extremely rare in terms of its success and that it virtually never ends a group um, effectively. So I think you know, we're on the same ground on that point for sure. Uh, I would only say that it's a, it's a rather, rather narrow study that you're citing and there's a lot of other different ways of dealing with these kinds of uh, actors. But looking at the question of how terrorist groups have evolved over the last 10 years and um, how the global picture has changed, 
Uh, just three quick points that strike me, having followed this for quite a long time. The first is that many, um, uh, in, in a sense, the first two points both relate to a different kind of hijacking. Uh, John, you used the term hijacking with respect to the religion of Islam. I would say that there has been a kind of a hijacking of local nationalist causes by a broader <coughs> ideology. And um, we won't call it Islamist. Uh, we'll call it uh, uh, a sort of a radical religion, a uh, religious viewpoint. And um, local nationalist groups, uh, everyone from um, the Al-Qaeda and the Islamic Maghreb, which uh, evolved out of the old GSPC, uh, Al-Shabaab, which has now announced a, um, an alliance with Al-Qaeda, we're not exactly sure how close that is, um, AQAP in Yemen, which was strictly a local and then a regional organization, now has links that are quite global, and those links go both ways. Al-Waqi is an American citizen, and uh, so the argument that simply there is a movement from these nationalist groups in the direction of the West is wrong. It's, it's in both directions, I would say, now. Um, that's the first point that I would say, that, that local nationalist groups that we used to focus on having local aims are now reflecting a much broader global agenda in a way that we feared would happen, and it is now a mature trend. Second trend is the hijacking of the dreams and aspirations of young Muslims, particularly in the West, and particularly um, as of uh, 2009 in the United States. Um, that's not to say that the problem in Europe and other parts of the West is, is less important, only that the Americans had a certain smug attitude that uh, the United States was immune. And that has clearly proven not to be the case. There's a lot of fear, uh, broad fear in the United States now uh, in the wake of many of the attempts that occurred beginning in uh, 2009, the underwear bomber, the Times Square bomber, uh, you know the list in the, in the press. This is a change. This is a, a maturation, again, of a trend where you see um, the uh, increased appearance of indigenous actors um, who are mainly inspired by the internet. And then the final point that I would make is um, a much more murky point, and it's, I think, just emerging uh, in a way that I'm not sure exactly how it will mature. But the connections between groups that use terrorism and then organized crime and illicit trade, uh, we used to have a sort of a mental framework where those who engage in organized crime and illicit trade are mainly oriented toward their own profit, but, um, and, and therefore they wanted to fly underneath the radar scope of the state and not bring the retribution of the state upon themselves. That's the kind of the framework that we lived with and believed in. Um, I'm beginning to have a lot of doubts about that framework. Uh, there is evidence um, emerging, I, I'm only talking about in the public press, of um, organized crime having provided materials to uh, groups um, and no longer trying to stay away from connection to those two groups that use terrorist attacks uh, in the way that they had in the past not just with respect to narco-terrorism, well-established, lots of um, arguments and studies on that, <coughs> but even possibly with the Moscow attacks. I don't know because I'm only reading the, po the popular press as you are, but the thing that captured my attention as a result of those attacks was not just the fact that um, uh, President Medvedev was very disappointed in the police uh, security uh, services, but also because there was a criminal gang that helped this group that had been, uh, members of which had been trained in Pakistan, but apparently according to some press reports, um, helped the group to gain the materials needed in order to carry out the attack. So I'm only speaking <coughs> as a consumer of the news. I don't have an insight into exactly what those connections are, but this is one of several examples that I could cite that is very worrisome about that relationship between organized crime and illicit trade on the one hand and terrorism on the other. I certainly want the Minister of Foreign Affairs of India in a few minutes to come back on that link between organized crime and, and, and terrorism. Before that, uh, Bruno Tetre, give us a, a perspective from, from France, from, from continental Europe on this issue, and particularly, I think, uh, an area that hasn't quite yet been met, mentioned, uh, the Maghreb, where Al-Qaeda in the Maghreb has uh, uh, begun to be very important. I, 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 I've been talking to a lot of people who've recently been in, in Mauritania and Nukshot, you can barely move around. And, in Nukshot now because of the increase in that threat has been underreported uh, challenge. Bruno, how do people look at this in France? Well, thank you, John. Indeed, the, the case of uh, Al-Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb, or Akim, I think that's what they call it, the U.S. Uh, military. Uh, we call it Akmi, obviously. Now, it's an interesting case in two different respects. First of all, because uh, Akmi, because it has been unable to strike French territory more broadly, European territory, but you know, Acme has a really, France has it in its, uh, uh, in the crosshairs, so to say, it has declared France as being its main enemy. But because
because it has been unable, uh, despite its attempt to strike French territory, it has, um, it has actually taken up the soft targets. And the soft targets are French, European, and other nationals in the Sahel region with, uh, with two different uh, objectives. And this is where, uh, actually, I'm following the lead of Audrey here because there is a business dimension which is quite important here. Uh, it's, it's becoming very difficult, especially for, for government who have to deal with this issue, it's becoming very difficult to separate between the strictly business dimension, the ransom, you're getting a ransom from uh, the French government or the families of the hostages, from the political dimension which is striking France and frankly, as the intelligence services in my country put it, humiliating France, which remains you know, a key objective here. So, um, and this is uh, where uh, the question of when do you intervene militarily, as my government has done um, a few days ago, becomes a tricky one because, uh, of course, as a government, your first uh, duty is to protect the life of your citizens. But sometimes uh, you have to intervene militarily in, in, uh, in three different kinds of circumstances. Well, I would say if at least two of these the following elements have been, uh, are, are present. One, if the life of the hostages are judged to be in imminent danger, that's apparently what happened in Niger uh, a few days ago. There was actionable intelligence that they say that uh, the, the abductors wanted to get rid of, quote unquote, the, uh, uh, the abductees. Uh, the second, uh, the second circumstance is when you want to send a political message because the, uh, uh, because the demands that have been made in some cases are just <coughs> impossible to meet. And that's in, indeed the third element, the third, the, the third possible circumstance where you do have sometimes a torture between you fourth, that when it does not appear that you can enter in any kind of uh, negotiation, uh, or at least not the kind of negotiation which, is, which a <coughs> democratic government can actually uh, can actually accept. So, um, uh, to sum up, I mean, the case of Al-Qaeda in Islamic Maghreb is indeed interesting that because it, it's a ransom of the success, so to say, of the fact that because, you know, intelligence services in Europe have been pretty good, transatlantic cooperation has been very good, and as a result, we haven't had a single major uh, terrorist attack which has succeeded in Europe for more than five years, but because of that precisely, now uh, Al-Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb is trying to make life impossible to Western nationals, uh, whatever their uh, creed, nationality, or business, by the way, although they do like to target, you know, for instance, uh, the French port in Niger, of course, because I think nobody is immune, frankly, uh, in, the, in the Sahel, but that's also a ransom of success, it's also because Indeed, uh, Europe has managed to avoid a direct attack on its, uh, on its territory. Uh, Minister uh, of Home Affairs of India, perhaps I could put this uh, question uh, to you. Um, we heard about the passport that's been uh, issued, and we've also heard about the, the need to um, respond to terrorist threats with a variety of uh, different instruments. In the West, there is this phrase that is often used, we must counter the terrorist narrative. Uh, and find some way to disassociate, for example, criticisms about Western foreign policy from uh, extreme uh, uh, Islamic terrorism directed against uh, the West. Is there a debate in India about countering uh, uh, the narrative of terrorism in India, especially since there are so many different narratives that are being struck in India? Or is that uh, not the way in which you, you look at it in India when you're thinking about the struggle against terrorism in India? See, what is this uh, narrative we're talking about? People are killing in the name of religion. People claim that they are avenging past injustices. Now one killing leads to another. The new groups claim that they are avenging <coughs> killings by the other group. I'm not an academic or scholar. I have to maintain law and order and put down terrorism in the country. While I deeply respect and compliment Mohammed Tahir and Kadri the Fatwa, I wonder how many of these terrorist groups how many members of these terrorist groups have had a change of heart after the fatwa? Now, quite right, 
exactly. There are any number of causes that give rise to violence. But the violence that is unleashed by insurgents, by communists or Maoist armed deliberation groups, but that is one kind of violence. What I see in India, both among groups where the members profess Islam, and groups whose members profess Hinduism. And earlier we had, in the 1980s, <coughs> members of groups who professed Sikhism. What I find is they are killing in the name of defending the honor of their religion. And they are killing people who, according to them, are either opposed to the religion or who are seen as enemies of their religion. To me, the only way to put down this kind of terror is to take a very firm stand against any terrorist act. Yes, we can wean some people by weaning them away from these groups and rehabilitating them, that is good. We have succeeded in persuading a number of young men in some parts of India to give up the path of violence, surrender and be rehabilitated. But those cases are few and far between. So I think uh, the state must take a firm stand against terrorist groups, identify them, apprehend them, punish them, preempt any terrorist facts. If there is a terrorist act that succeeds, punishment must be swift <coughs> punishment. Before I open it up uh, to questions, let me um, uh, ask a, a question about uh, <coughs> challenges of social cohesion in our society. Because I think Audrey made a very good point that uh, homegrown terrorism uh, is now a problem uh, throughout the world, and even in the United uh, States, where I think the presumption was that uh, <coughs> Americans were it was an assimilated society. And I sometimes uh, make the point that where the United States, for a time, had an advantage was it understood the distinction between an adjective and a noun. In the United States, you have Italian Americans, you have Polish Americans, you have Jewish Americans, you have Muslim Americans, and they all keep their identity of origin in some way, but the noun is American. The qualifier is that they might be Italian or Polish or Jewish or Muslim. In the UK, I always thought we suffered by this uh, lack of adequate distinction between the adjective and the noun, because in the UK, you know, we have, you know, uh, uh, British Asians, we have British Jews, we have British Caribbeans, and we have British Muslims, and the noun is what in the United States is the qualifier. So people see themselves as Muslim or Jew, and only secondarily as British. And I wonder whether there's more of a duty of the state, uh, not to assimilate, but at least to integrate, and to make uh, the state, and the sense of citizenship, the noun, and the religious and ethnic and, and cultural element, uh, <coughs> an important qualifier and, uh, and, and, and an important part of identity, but the noun is, is the state. And uh, I, I turn with that long preface to Imran Khan because I think you depressed everybody in this room by saying that Tahir here would be in, 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 in fear of his life if he were in Pakistan because the judges would, were, and, the, and the judges were, 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 were to incriminate the person who, who, who killed your governor and that there was really no hope and that, and that the drone attacks had to end. Now let's presume that there's no military operation in Pakistan. How do you open up and recapture that space still? And how do you speak to the Pakistani population in a way that inspires them to think another way? Well, you know, it's not, I didn't want to depress everyone. I just, it's not as bad as it looks. It's much worse. <laughs> Hello, um, um, as long as there is occupation of Afghanistan, and the U.S. keeps pushing Pakistan to do more in the tribal areas. You are actually helping Al-Qaeda. Terrorism 
international terrorism will grow because this will become the cause for Al Qaeda to rally. Uh, if I was, if, I, if we wanted to end this thing, I would try and isolate Al Qaeda because Al Qaeda is the threat to Western civilization. So rather than isolating it, the last thing I would do is that there are about a million armed men in Pakistan's tribal areas. Every man knows how to use a gun from the age of 10 onwards. Every man is armed. Now, is this a sensible policy of pushing this million men towards Al-Qaeda rather than isolating Al-Qaeda, which according to Pentagon, there are only 200 or 300 Al-Qaeda left in that part of the world. So I think this is one of the most brainless wars ever being fought. <laughs> I do not see it's 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 immoral. I think it's insane. Bombing. I mean, how do you fight terrorism by bombing uh, villages? I mean, how do you think that uh, th this is not going to happen? That these people are not going to get more radicalized? And so how? And this is exactly what Al Qaeda wants. It wants the, you know the world to think that this is a war against Islam. It will have a never-ending a number of recruits. It will have it will these will become holy warriors. Exactly what Mr. Tahir al Qadri is saying. You want to de-link Islam. And so surely, what is happening in Afghanistan and Pakistan actually is now become a war of resistance against the Pakistan army in the tribal areas, against the US army in the Pashtun, in, in NATO in the Pashtun areas, is now a, a war of liberation. And I'm afraid uh, we will be sitting here three years from now, and we will be still, this will still keep going on, and the West will not be any safer. So there is, needs to be a but change the, of strategy. The question is how you make you make Pakistan safer for Pakistanis. Look, I myself am not safe. How can I make Pakistan safe? <laughs> the situation in Pakistan right now is that you have to tread such a thin line now. You have to be so careful. It, anything could be misinterpreted as you're a, a collaborator with the, with the enemy now. And so therefore, Mr. Tyrell Qadri is not living in Pakistan. There's another scholar, Javed Ramdi, who spoke out against it. He's living in Malaysia today. As Islamic imams have been shot in mosques, there are suicide attacks, more attacks in mosques going on against any scholar who dares say anything about uh, you know, Islam being against suicide bombing. So, I mean, how am I going to now stand up and say that, look, uh, you know, this is, it's very naughty, wrong, don't do these things, unless the root cause is tackled, and that is, I'm afraid, what is going on in, 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 in Afghanistan and Pakistan's tribal areas. Well, well, we'll no doubt return to this, but we've only got 15 minutes, so it's really time to open it up to, to everybody here. Uh, uh, we'll bring in your views on social cohesion, I'm sure, because it'll be uh, brought up. So uh, why don't, uh, if you want to ask a question or make a comment that w would inspire a response, please raise your hand, and I'll recognize you. Um, and if no one does, we can keep on asking questions of ourselves for the next 10 15 minutes very easily. Uh, Audrey Croden wants to ask a question. No, you go ahead. I think as the token American on the panel, I probably should say something, um, which is uh, that I agree with you that there should be much more disaggregation of the threat, and that the original um, action in Afghanistan should have been more focused specifically on al-Qaeda, but the situation in Afghanistan did not begin the day that the United States, through its various proxies, um, entered Afghanistan. Uh, in uh, 2001, late 2001. I mean, it, it was a situation that was uh, the source of the attack that arrived on the United States uh, territory, obviously. I'm not saying anything that you don't know. Um, but it isn't that the United States invented the threat that was there. Now, whether the military action subsequent to that has um, worsened that threat, there I think we, <coughs> there are some things that you've said that I would agree with. My only plea to you is how can we move forward? It's not as if we can simply leave the country instantaneously. I mean, the the uh, occupation or the action or the military presence in Afghanistan is also um, accompanied by a tremendous amount of development assistance and work to try to build a state, however, in my personal opinion from the outset, however misguided and naive that may have been. Uh, it's not only a military occupation, although I understand that there are many uh, elements, particularly of the Taliban, that are responding in the way that Afghanis respond. Uh, and then the last thing I would say is that um, some of the threat has come from across the border. I think we need to recognize that we didn't invent the fact that there are some operatives that have had um, sanctuary and uh, have, have been in Pakistan. And now I. 
I think that it has been a mistake to generalize about the nature of those operatives and to call Al-Qaeda all of these various different elements, the Haqqani network, all of the various parts of the Taliban and so on. We're on the same page on that. But we need to be careful where exactly we start writing history. Well, Al-Qaeda was trained by CIA. Uh, trained. I, I think the ISI had a bit to do with it as well. But, right? And ISI something. was funded by the CIA. So they arrived, Al-Qaeda was, <laughs> Osama bin Laden arrived in Pakistan on a CIA plane. A friend of mine had drinks with Osama bin Laden in 1989 in the American embassy. So let's get this thing right now. Um, Pakistan did not invent these groups. Pakistan was a frontline state where there were four million refugees from Afghanistan. Uh, Pakistan, the militant groups today, which you're talking about, and with, with the Honorable Minister is talking about, which are a source of worry to India, were created then, during the Afghan Jihad. Then, of course, the same people who were fighting Jihad were heroes, and Ronald Reagan called them, reminding the, the, that he, they reminded him of the founding fathers of the U.S. I mean, the same Hikmat Yar, who's considered now um, a, a terrorist, was a, was a hero. I mean, I attended a ball for the Mujahideen in London in the 80s. So let's get that right first. These people were created at that point, and then suddenly, uh, now that uh, these people have turned against the Pakistan, but the same Pakistan army, which ISI, which built them, is now hunting them down, and they are killing the Pakistan army. And this this idea that uh, people going from North Waziristan into Afghanistan, if that did not happen, somehow the U.S. would win the war. I'm afraid if you look back at the history of Afghanistan, starting from the British, you go back to the Russians. I mean, the Russians killed one million Afghans. They still lost the war. Let's, but, um, let's not try to decide whether the campaign in Afghanistan is going to be successful, because all of us have very powerful views on on, on whether the campaign in Afghanistan is going to be successful. And one of the problems of, of that is that we, we keep on redefining what the campaign in Afghanistan is about, because you have on one extreme people who say that if the campaign in Afghanistan is about eliminating the international threat from al-Qaeda based in Afghanistan, the answer to that is famously mission accomplished. The international threat of al-Qaeda per se in Afghanistan now is, as you say, quoting the CIA, pretty minimal. Uh, but if you say the campaign in Afghanistan is to ensure that the Taliban does not have authority over uh, important parts of Afghanistan, the mission is far from accomplished. So it's a question of deciding uh, whether you want to stick to the original mission or to the mission that became uh, the uh, task that uh, uh, Western forces in association with others ascribe to themselves as the challenge of the Afghanistan nation state became all the more evident to yeah, them. But, but let's go back to social cohesion because I want... I want um, to tell here, yeah, because we can go on until, until 7 or 8 on Afghanistan, but why don't you say a word as a, a leader on how you inspire this kind of social cohesion that doesn't tempt people <coughs> to be inspired by the militarization of their societies into the militarization of themselves? Mr. Chairman, this is again a very significant question. The question of social cohesion is uh, again multidimensional. First of all, we have three kind of models, and we have to choose one of them. One model is isolation, living in different societies. Second model is assimilation or annihilation. And the third model is integration. Most of the people of having specific ethnic background, and particularly the Muslims who migrated in the Western world, European countries and other places, those who are very conservative or extremistic in their views, or those who are not very open or liberal, they prefer to have an isolated life that is totally against the teachings of Islam. On the other hand, some people in Western world, they, in the name of integration, they are thinking of annihilation and assimilation. And they are moving towards the idea of uniculturalism. The best option for social cohesion would be the integration to keep their identities. And I have seen the society of Britain. I spent most of my time in Britain. I have seen the society of Canada. I spent quite a long time in the United States in Canada and the, in the U.S. too. And the European countries used to be now, they are a little bit going towards uniculturalism. So these societies, those who profess or who prefer multiculturalism, this will save 
and this will proceed towards the dream of social cohesion. Let's because start. their identity and cultural identity, religious identity or ethnic identity is not in danger. And the second thing, let me please complete. One thing, we should go to integration. Yeah. And second thing, in order to move further, as there was a debate, in order to move further, how to come to an end to this war of terror and to create a cohesion in the society everywhere, we need to address the global and regional political issue. I'm not going to uh, to support or to rebut any specific point of view, but I would say three main or four, four crucial issues. The Israel and Palestine four. Israel and Palestine issue yeah. should be addressed okay. as early Take as possible. And <coughs> and the second thing and the second yeah. Iraq issue okay. should be settled as early as possible. Uh -huh. Third, this Afghanistan issue should be settled as early as possible. And, and talking of the regional problem between India and Pakistan and local organization, the disputes between Pakistan and okay. Kashmir are to be resolved so that the people may not get the wrong benefit and they may not exploit the existing disputes and convert into their own terroristic activities. If we address these political issues, it means that we will Got give it. a good positive message to the Muslim Absolutely. community There's a that we are not against any community we, we, and therefore we are working together. We all agree that those issues have to be solved and there are, yes, a great political challenge is the sequencing that, as the minister rightly said, you have today, tomorrow, the day after uh, to deal with actual terrorist Except threats. And none, of, none of these political <coughs> issues or political disputes or social disputes justify exactly. terror as an instrument of policy making. None of them justify terror. Uh, you can always uh, uh, I mean, attribute a terrorist act to some political dispute in some corner of the world. Uh, and I don't think that's the way uh, civilized society should settle their disputes. I, 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 no, no, but I have to bring in Bruno Tetre who wants to come in. Because we, you have, you have, you'll have half a minute, but Bruno Tetre, because you talked about, and these are three very different things. Assimilation, integration, multiculturalism are actually three very different things and you can't um, you, you have to decide which route you go to and, uh, and which is different than multiculturalism and different than assimilation France and experience with all three Bruno no it's, it's actually I wanted to come back on that on two very quick both yeah. points John uh, we we in France we've been criticizing our whole quote integration model for very long and with some saying we should be more assimilationist others saying we should be more multiculturalist. But then what happened, what's fascinating is that what's happened in the past five years is that the British and the Germans have been criticizing their own models even more than yeah. we have our own yeah. model. Uh, and it's interestingly, and it was not a given eight years ago, it was not a given, I find it interesting that we in France have managed to maintain our consensus when we passed you know, two very uh, sens sensible uh, laws on visible religious signs and more recently on, uh, on the vase in, uh, in public space. Uh, the second bullet point joint was, there is, uh, let's face it, there is a, a radicalization process of some young disenfranchised Muslims in the name of Islam in France, it exists, let's, let's face it, it's a reality. But also at the same time, remember when, when we had these big uh, riots in the French suburbs in, two, in November 2005, it was never in the name of whatever religious cause was always in the cause of disenfranchisement, uh, discrimination, etc. So interestingly enough, uh, this, this, uh, this radicalization process has never taken a social and political dimension that many fear it would after 2001 in particular. Uh, I'm going to, in a second, bring in Mr. Dawash, who's been waiting to ask a question. We really can't complete the session without having some questions from the audience, otherwise the Dawash will be worried. But let me, let me put in one provocative thought. Uh, and that is that I think addressing the symptoms of a problem is sometimes an underestimated uh, response. Uh, I have been in countless meetings over 30 years in a strategic study domain saying we have to address the root causes. And I remember having a cold once during one of these debates and it suddenly occurred to me then that for a thousand years people have been trying to address the root causes of a cold and no one has been successful. And yet, if you take a bit of paracetamol or norofen or some aspirin, you address the symptoms and then cold, your, your cold is over. And I'm quite satisfied with my symptoms being addressed quite quickly, even if for a thousand years the root causes haven't been dealt with. And I think sometimes we do have 
especially in the academic establishments, uh, concede that the root causes are the only way to deal with any problem. If you deal very effectively with the symptoms, then you don't have a problem. And I think that is something that I think should be weighed in the balance as well. Mr. Dora. That means a lot of bombing. <coughs> No, okay. that does need not mean bombing at all. What Mr. is it? My name is Tarek Darwaz, and yeah. I come from Jordan, which is a moderate state and uh, not a very friendly neighborhood. Margin. You come from Jordan, go I ahead. come from Jordan, and we're surrounded by... Uh, uh, we're basically in the Middle East. <laughs> and I... <laughs> <laughs> we all know... And, and, and growing up in a moderate state... <laughs> and growing up in a moderate state, I see the causes of the problem are becoming more and more economic, so I think... Instead of, the easiest way to tackle this issue would be through economy. Mm -hmm. And as long as there is more war and more occupation, people are going to be more frustrated and you're fueling the growth of extremism, which, <coughs> as you can see in the Middle East and North Africa is occurring today, which scares me as a citizen of the world seeing this happening because it's a, it can be a domino effect and mm -hmm. this can all be tackled through basic economics. So I think with all the money being spent on wars, a much more viable alternative would be to educate the, the young people and turn them away from extremism. The economic, <laughs> political, and French <French's coughs> is a very important way of addressing some of the symptoms. Mr. Uh, Imam Sigal, you had a question, I think, um, or a comment. So I just want to ask us, terrorism, terrorist has no religion. No religion says it will kill anyone. But what about those uh, terrorists, and I want to ask the minister to that question, who are without religion, for example, the nationalists, they are a threat. And according to your prime minister, they are the greatest threat to your country. So basically, a terrorist, a person who uses means, whether he's religion or whatever, whatever cause he uses, he uses it for a purpose, for a mindless purpose, and I agree with you, he must be dealt with firmly, whether it's in Pakistan or in India, or in the United States. Before we get a reaction, Mr. Sunil Mungjal here, if you can ask a question, the microphone in the front, front row. Can I ask without the mic? Uh, you can, but I think it's better if you ask with the mic, because okay. uh, who knows how many things are being recorded here. Certainly. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it's clear that the state players have to do what they have to do, whether it's intelligence gathering or it's military action or police action. Do you think there is a role here for media and think tanks, especially considering the point that you made, mm. that we also need to work on not just the root cause, but also fixing the problem temporarily to allow some of it to, to, to lie down and, and fix itself? Because clearly media is, is forming uh, opinion, especially the mass media today, forms public opinion. <coughs> and think tanks have a role to play here. And so far, what we've seen think tanks do, most of them, is look at historical fact what's happened and write, write reports. What about some ideas about some solutions, even temporary ones? Well, it'll please the World Economic Forum no end if Audrey Cronin answered that question uh, completely and comprehensively. Oh, my, the pressure's on. Um, actually, the, in answer to your question, I, I want to point out that in most terrorist campaigns, there are not two actors, the state and the group. There are three. The third one is the audience, mm -hmm. or the audiences, all the different audiences. And that's where your point about the media, the think tanks, we're talking about this on-off switch. It's only the state and the group, and that's the wrong way to look at this. That's what gets to um, Mr. Muhammad's point, that, that by issuing that fatwa, he is influencing that audience, and that audience may or may not become more or less um, susceptible to either of these other two sides of the triangle. So this is where your suggestion that think tanks and media and so forth can play a more active role because it is that third side that we're neglecting. And those are the potential recruits, yeah. the potential intimidated people, those who are actually swayed by the violence and give the group the initiative or the incentive to carry it out as a symbolic gesture to begin with. So it's not an on-off switch between groups and repression. And, um, Minister of um, Home Affairs of India, maybe uh, could you address uh, in a moment Mr. Dowie's question that as you look at the mix of policy uh, options, uh, you look at a lot of short and medium term ones, but in the long term, uh, in India, is there a debate that, uh, that relates uh, education and economic enfranchisement to mitigating the terrorist threat, or do you think that these are separate issues and, and, and that these um, terrorist threats have very particular causes that are not related? 
um, the poverty or education and the Terrorist groups, as we know them, Al Qaeda, Taliban, 